but it's an actual country. So we have uh, this region of Asia, and in the eastern, or excuse me, western part of Asia, uh, here East Asia, Southeast Asia, Northern Asia, Western Asia, and of course, you know, it's like the United States. You have different regions, so um, you you have those those areas. So it's located in Western. Asia, and uh, of course there's Turkey, there's the flag, and a lot of biblical cities and places are in that area of Turkey. Um, I've always wanted to go on one of those uh, uh, Mediterranean cruises um, that goes to these different countries and different cities. It's a biblical archaeology uh, thing, but they're very, very expensive because there's not that many people that go on those. Um, I've never been able to afford it, but the uh, uh, but some of those ancient cities are are modern cities. They don't always call them the same thing, but they they're still there, uh, believe it or not. <clears throat> and so, following the journeys of the Apostle Paul, um, we'll kind of go uh, with this first missionary journey. And then Istanbul is an ancient city. It's formerly known as Constantinople, also Byzantium during the, uh, uh, the Byzantine Empire, uh, that same city. So it's a very ancient city that dates back to about 600 uh, B.C. before Christ um, when Justin um, uh, uh, and his wife, I can't remember his name, her name, but anyway, they uh, founded that city. They were the rulers of the Byzantine Empire, and so. Uh, but formerly Constantinople, the Bosporus Straits. We talked a little bit about the importance of that. Um, and uh, Istanbul is one of the few cities. I think there's three cities in the world that is split by a waterway, and uh, Istanbul is one of those. So you have the ancient city on one side. And then on the other side, and there's the back side of the uh, Hagia Sophia uh, Mosque that was a Catholic church. And uh, during the Constantinople, during uh, Constantine's reign, it was a Catholic church. And then it was changed into a mosque. And so inside you'll have uh, features of a cathedral, but also the symbols of the, of the mosque. And these are, and by the way, uh, we talked about Islam and the five pillars of Islam and these symbols. I don't read or speak Arabic, but I was reading about that. Uh, these symbols here are words and statements that talk about Allah and Allah being great, and Muhammad being the prophet, and things like that. So, uh, but it does have the look of a of a cathedral um, during that that time. And so the Bosporus Straits separate the ancient city. Uh, from the modern city. So just across the, the way, there are two bridges that cross over the Bosporus Straits. Um, you have that, that modern city there uh, on the other side. Um, very, very narrow. The widest spot is like nine miles wide, uh, much like the uh, uh, Straits of Gibraltar. Close by there, you have the hot springs, geothermic action activity. Um, the United States takes advantage, is the country that takes the most advantage of geothermic it's uh, uh, groundwater that goes close by the magma under the earth, uh, crust, and it heats up the water, and that's where you have the geysers out in Yellowstone. Has anybody ever been to Yellowstone? Yeah, so you can see Old Faithful that, you know, go, erupts at the, a certain amount of time. It's uh, like clockwork. Uh, that water goes down near the magma and superheats, and steam comes up and everything. Um, same thing here in Turkey. A lot of Europeans go on vacation there uh, to uh, Istanbul. <clears throat> uh, so again, the Bosporus Straits are a very important uh, area because, and there's, there's the uh, Bosporus Straits right through here. Um, they don't charge anybody to go through, but it's a very important waterway from the Black Sea down to the Mediterranean. And so a lot of shipping containers go through there, uh, uh, and uh, that's one reason why you have the Crimean Peninsula up the top where it is uh, um, there is Ukraine, that's the bottom of Ukraine, so that's why Russia is wanting that so they can have that warm water port 
be able to get into the Mediterranean, which gets them to the rest of the world. Um, and that's a little bit what we talked about. So Ankara is the capital city, and they have it's called a presidential republic. It is a NATO um, uh, country. It is one of our, our allies. Um, several years ago, there was a rift between Turkey and Syria. Syria was talking about invading Turkey. Turkey was talking about invading Syria, which made it kind of sketchy because, according to the NATO charter, the United States would have had to go into war with Turkey if they invaded or if they were uh, invaded into uh, because of the NATO charter, because we you know, are in uh, the North Atlantic Trade Organization that says that we will protect anybody else and everybody else in that treaty organization protects that. Russia is not in NATO, nor is Ukraine. So that's why it's a little bit of a standoff over there. Um, modern city of Ankara, um, there, the Bowtie Building. And of course, uh, they have mosque and everything. It's a Muslim country um, uh, for that. So uh, they have a... Uh, um, a, like, like a lot of Muslim countries, especially Saudi Arabia is the, probably the most uh, like this, but um, they have a regular police force, judicial, that deals with regular laws, and then they have a religious police force in a lot of those Muslim countries. Now, Turkey is not so much. It's a lot more relaxed. Uh, women can get driver's license. Women can go to school. Women can own property things like that. Other Muslim countries, they're very, very strict, and they, they can't. They can't even, uh, uh, women are not even allowed to learn to read in some of those countries today. I mean, this is not like hundreds of years ago. So it's a presidential republic. The president doesn't have as much power. Um, and so, uh, uh, again, this is the area we're, we're looking at here. And then we go to Cyprus. Cyprus is uh, the little island country. It's about uh, three times the size of Rhode Island, smaller than New Hampshire, uh, about a fifth the size of um, South Carolina. So it's a, a small country. Nicosia is, Nicosia is the capital. Northern Cyprus is self-proclaimed independent but not recognized by any other country nor maybe Iran but nor uh, is it recognized as a separate country by the United Nations. So um, in order for a country to uh, uh, exist as an independent country, they have to be recognized by the United Nations as well as five other countries uh, that are in the United Nations. And uh, um, Israel did that in 1948. Uh, Harry Truman was the first to recognize their independence. And so... Um, so there, Cyprus is in this little area here. You can see um, the little island country there. And uh, there's a little close-up. There's their map. They're proud of the shape and their, their country because it's on their map. Uh, excuse me, their flag. And so, uh, but a beautiful country, beautiful scenery. And last week I'd mentioned that it would be nice to uh, visit there. I don't know about living there, but... Um, but wouldn't that be nice to kind of wade out in that water there? Three places on the earth that the water is crystal clear like that. And Cyprus and Bahamas is uh, one of those in place off the coast of India. And so um, uh, you have that ancient city, ancient country. But it's not without its problems, Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Cyprus. They even try to have their own flag. But it's, again, it's not recognized um, how they do that. Now, the ancient regions, and this is kind of where we began to leave off. The ancient regions, first of all, Cilicia. Cilicia is a, became a Roman province in 102 B.C., before Christ. Um, so this would be the time, uh, uh, you know, just as Julius Caesar was coming into power, so it was before uh, that, before the problems between uh, uh, Octavius and Mark Anthony. And so uh, uh, became a Roman province. This is the province where it's at. They're in southern, eastern, southeastern Turkey. And uh, some of the ancient ruins are still there to this day. You have a watchtower there. Um, and this is a, in, uh, a statue cut into rock, a solid piece of rock, uh, on the, uh, a hill 
to um, the goddess Athena, <clears throat> who was the patron goddess of Ephesus, and we'll talk about that later on. There was, um, there was a, a uh, uh, in tradition says there used to be a large Jewish settlement there in Cilicia. Never have they found anything until uh, back in the early 90s they did find a stone doorpost with uh, Jewish writing on it. And so, um, you know, Hebrew letters and everything, so maybe that was a possibility. Um, but, again, this is the modern city that surrounds, and the ruins here are Tarsus, the um, uh, birthplace of Paul. And I'll, you'll get that in your notes in a second. So, again, you have a modern city close by the ancient city. Obviously, the buildings are not always, always there. Um, but here is that Roman road that was built, and, of course, uh, there we have. So, Cilicia became a Roman province. It was famed for its cloth made from goat hair. Isn't that amazing? Who knew that goats would be able to make all kind of stuff, you know? <clears throat> Traditionally, um, that's what sackcloth would be made from, goat hair. So it's a very rough uh, cloth. Remember in the Bible when they said they would, don, they would put on sackcloth and ashes? Um, the sackcloth was... Uh, uh, the closest thing we would have anything like that here in the United States would be burlap. So burlap. Can you imagine burlap? And all of your clothes, undergarments, everything would be made out of this cloth and you would put that on and it would uh, cause, obviously, cause you discomfort. And the ashes, if you've ever had ash and you begin to sweat and it gets down to your eyes, um, ashes is very fine and it gets in your mouth and everything so that that whole, it was causing, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that remembrance of sorrowness is what that whole thing, sackcloth and ashes. Um, the ash, the fine stuff of ash, you know, you can, uh, one, time I, one time and one time only in my whole life did I ever pick up any ashes with my hand. And guess what happened? There's hot coals in the ashes, even though there's, it doesn't feel like it. There's hot coals. I burned my hand. I never picked them up again. Um, in, in Haiti, the word for ash is sun, uh, real close to the word for blood. Sun is blood. Sun is, is ash. And uh, they have uh, wasps that build their nests in, in the, uh, the cactus hedgerows and on the back of leaves and things like that um, on mango trees. And they'll use the ash and throw it on the, the uh, uh, wasp nest. And it says it blinds them and it confuses them. And it, and it says they fly off and they can't get back to their nest. Well, it may cause some problems with their eyes. But actually, in the hymenopter class, a lot of the insects in the hymenopter class breathe through their abdomen. So it actually suffocates them is what happens. And so you can watch those, those wasps. They'll fly out, you know covered in ash, and uh, they'll fly, and then you'll see them like that, you know, so, uh, so it's kind of funny, but, um, but anyway, that's kind of what they do, but sackcloth and ashes, it was called Cilicium from uh, Cilicia. Paul lived there in from 40 to 45 AD, and Tarsus is the capital city of Cilicia. It's also the birthplace of the Apostle Paul. The Bible says in Acts 21, 39, but Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. This is when the uh, people gathered him there uh, in Ephesus. Some of the uh, historical ideas and descriptions, every uh, uh, Roman city following the Greeks had a like a Parthenon. Okay? The Parthenon was where they had the collection of their gods. A Parthenon is the same thing to uh, the Greeks and Romans as the Kaaba is to the early Arabs before uh, uh, Muhammad got them all into one religion. Um, so that is one of the temples. They all had the Parthenon temple where they worshipped Zeus and then, of course, later on, 
when the Romans conquered the Greeks. Uh, they changed Zeus's name to uh, Jupiter. It was the same demon they worshipped. It's all demon worship. They just changed their names is what it was. Uh, so the Greek gods were given Roman names. <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, so that's where you have all that mythology and everything. They would uh, try to appease the gods. This is Cleopatra's gate. It was built uh, for Cleopatra, who was supposedly one of the most beautiful women. Um, uh, caused a, a war, literally, uh, because of her and her, the affection she had toward one man or the other <clears throat> there in uh, Cilicia. So, um, again, birthplace of Saul. When he started his uh, missionary journey, Acts chapter 13, they did go back there, and, uh, but never said that he planted a church. But there was some churches there in Cilicia, but um, probably not directly planted by, uh, by the Apostle Paul. It is not the same as Tarshish. Jonah chapter 1 talks about as Jonah paid the fare, he went down to Tarshish. Tarshish, again, um, is a term that means a smelting plant. So as they, uh, there were a lot of places that were named Tarshish. Uh, so like uh, uh, there's other Greenvilles. You have Greenville, South Carolina, Greenville, North Carolina, Greenville, Mississippi, and probably a bunch of other Greenvilles. So <clears throat> those are the places. But, um, but anyway, so not the same place. Now, Cyprus, the other ancient place, the gospel is preached first by the missionaries, very first missionaries, Acts chapter 13. Paul and Barnabas are sent out. In fact, uh, the Bible says, as they were praying and diligently working in the church in Antioch, it lists five men, and uh, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. And they laid hands on them and sent them out from the church there at Antioch. And they went and gave the gospel for the first time as a missionary uh, group that went out. And the Bible says they went at Salamis. And they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister, John Mark, uh, the nephew of Barnabas. And so this is the area where they went, Salamis. And it is a legitimate place, and these are the ruins of the place. You can see um, here is the exact same layout that they have um, here in the amphitheater. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Paul and Barnabas did not preach at this one, but they did preach in some other places just like this. But they would have walked right in front of this area because this was the center of activity, right at the port. How many of you ever been to Charleston, South Carolina? Yeah, everything, you know, the, the old city is right there at the port, you know. Uh, the original um, uh, Charlestown landing is down a little ways towards Polly Island, but, um, but you, have, uh, uh, you have the ancient area the establishment is exactly the same places uh, in fact charleston is unique that it has the oldest government building in the united states at the end of broad street you go down it's the uh, old exchange the old customs house and uh, <clears throat> you go down into broad street and it's right there on on uh, meeting street but if you've ever been to king street in charleston that used to be the out the uh, outlying road, that was the outskirts. Now it's like right in the center of the city. So, um, so same thing. Paul and Barnabas would have walked by these very spots when they came into the port there at Salamis. And so uh, the gospel is preached by the first missionary. Satan tries to stop him. We talked about that. The uh, demon-possessed guy, the sorcerer, withstood them. And uh, the deputy wanted to, Sergius Paulus wanted to hear the gospel. And so uh, he was saved in spite of Satan's attempts. And one commentator said that this is the, the highest ranking government official to ever accept Christ. Um, that is recorded in the Bible. Now maybe there were some others, but the Bible records this one. 
And so the Bible says the deputy, when he saw what was done, because the uh, uh, bar Jesus or the uh, uh, sorcerer, Paul turns and rebukes him and says, you're going to be blind. He goes away grasping around, looking, helping someone. The Bible says a mist falls over his eyes. He cannot see. And so uh, people were astonished. But, but uh, the deputy believes is astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Never heard some things like that. Uh, remember what they said about Jesus? They said, he speaks as one who has authority. And then later they said, he speaks as no man has spoken before because they hadn't heard these things. And so that's the same thing with uh, the Apostle Paul and, and Barnabas. Um, and so Sergius Paulus was saved. John Mark departs for whatever reason. Later on, he does come back. Um, in fact, that's the reason why Paul and Barnabas um, uh, decided to split in Acts chapter, after, uh, Acts chapter 15. Um, Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas start out. Um, around verse 9 of Acts chapter 16, um, uh, Luke joins them, and uh, uh, the writer of the book of Acts. And so um, that's where he finds Timothy in Acts chapter 16. But he, him, Barnabas and Saul and Paul were so much against you know, each other with their idea of who should go with them because Barnabas said, let's, let's give John Mark another try. And Paul said, nope, he left us once, he'll leave us again, and I'm not going to go with him. And so they divided. They, they went their separate ways. You never hear about Barnabas after that, you know, Barnabas and Mark, John Mark, until later on in, in uh, uh, he tells Timothy, he says, uh, and send John Mark, he is profitable to me. So he does redeem himself which is a good thing for us to understand that, you know what? We fail the Lord many times, but there's redemption in God. Uh, I was listening, I listened to a, uh, a podcast, devotional podcast, and uh, uh, in the morning I have a little speaker in the bathroom, so I'm listening as I'm getting ready, you know, and, and I'll, and uh, uh, he mentioned the other day, he's going, he's going through the book of Psalms, and he mentioned the other day, he said, uh, he said, um, there's never a sin that is too deep for the mercy of God to reach. And that is so true. God's grace and God's mercy is everlasting. And I think we can see that through the life of John Mark. Um, you know, Timothy, he appears... He appears more times, he's mentioned more times than anybody else by the Apostle Paul. But Timothy, we never hear from him. He never speaks. He never writes. Um, after the Apostle Paul, we never hear anything else about Timothy. Uh, we don't know really what happened to him. Uh, he could have turned his back on God. We don't even know that. But what we do know is that the Lord used him in a great way uh, there in uh, Ephesus but John Mark, they do leave. He does leave for whatever reason, and of course uh, uh, he comes back. But Par Barnabas and Saul split at this time on the second missionary journey. Barnabas goes with John Mark. Paul goes with Silas, and you don't hear from uh, Barnabas and uh, uh, John Mark again. And I believe it's because, you know, Barnabas is mentioned as an apostle, um, as one who is sent, but... I believe, and there was another apostle that was chosen by the twelve, the eleven. They drew straws. Remember that they went up to the upper room after Jesus was crucified, and Peter said, "We got to replace Judas somehow, so let's draw straws." And uh, a little bit of Bible trivia: Do you remember the guy's name that they chose? Starts with the M. Matthias. Matthias. That's right. The reason I know that is we were thinking about naming our oldest son Matthias. <laughs> That's the reason I knew that. But anyway. Um, but they choose him and put him in the midst of them, but you never hear about him ever again past, past uh, chapter 3 of the book of Acts. You never hear Matthias again. The apostle Paul, I believe, because of chapter 9 of look at the book of Acts, Jesus himself chose Paul, and I think he chose him to replace Judas as one of the twelve. Um, and he says several times, I'm an apostle by, by the will of God. I'm an apostle. He refers to himself later as the apostle to the Gentiles, which 
we're going to see the reason why here in just a minute. Um, but uh, I believe he was the one that replaced Judas in the 12. And I believe he will be the one that will be in the seat, the, the 12 thrones in the book of the Revelation. He talks about the 12 apostles. I believe Paul will be there. Um, and if we get up there and it's, it's Matthias, then we'll, <laughs> we'll all be corrected. But I believe it, I believe it will be the apostle Paul. Um, so anyway, so great things happen there. Great lessons are learned um, in the terms of missiology when you're studying missions and, and everything. And, of course, you know, my past and everything with, with missions and all, trying to figure out what to do and how to do things. Um, I've studied intently these chapters of how they dealt with problems and, and what they did and, and everything. And, um, and it, it's a very integral part that that is the very beginning of missions. And uh, I think that's the, that's the key. Um, now missions, and the reason we have missions and the objective of missions has really grown from there, but that's the beginning and I think that's where it's important to get back to. Poseidia. Poseidia, here's the mountains of uh, modern Poseidia, same as they were back in the time of Paul. Uh, different region, the aqueducts built by Octavius. Uh, Augustus Caesar, that to get the water into those area during that Pax Romana, there are five Roman emperors during that time of the Peace of Rome. Uh, the Roman rose there, still the ancient cities, and this is the uh, ruins that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas most likely stood right in this little area because this was the gate to the city, and no doubt they walked through the main gate of the city. The Bible says they went into the synagogue, and the synagogue was inside the town, and so they would have had to go through that, so they, they walked in that very area. There's another view of it. So Antioch of Poseidia, not the same Antioch of Syria. He goes and preaches in the synagogue. Now, why does he go to the synagogue? Because the synagogue is not a temple. Now, the temple is in Jerusalem at this time, when Paul, the Apostle Paul is. Today, it's is destroyed and they have a mosque built over that spot. But they go to the synagogue. The synagogues were a place of teaching. So the Jews, when they were scattered around areas, they needed somewhere to go to get together to kind of have fellowship and things like that. And so they came to this, these places they called synagogues where they came and they would hear the reading of the Torah and the rabbis would be there to teach them. So why not go to that area? You know, don't go to the heathen first is what their idea was. Let's go and find the religious people that know who the one true God is, Jehovah God, and let's tell them that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. That makes perfect sense to go there, you know. Um, it's just like when people get saved, you know, you say you need, you need to follow in believer's baptism to identify with people. And, uh, you know, you could go down to the flea market and say, I'm going to get baptized today because I follow Christ and I, I'm saved and I want to follow him in believer's baptism. You're not going to get the same response as if you were to come into a church, a Baptist church, and say, I got saved and I'm following a believer's baptism. You're going to get a different response because we understand what that's talking about. You go down to the flea market, they're going to think, oh, now he's, he's saved because he's baptized. You know, it's not the same thing. Well, that's the reason why they went to the synagogues because these people already knew the things of God. They already knew the prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus. And so they go and they preach in the synagogues and the Bible says they go down and they preach after the reading of the law and the prophets and that's what they would do. They would read out the law, they would read the prophets and then sometimes they would read in the Psalms. The rulers of the synagogue sent unto them say... Uh, you men and brethren. And, you know, they saw these strange people come in, Paul and Barnabas, and uh, they were Jews, and so they knew what to do, they knew what to act, how to act, <coughs> to cover their head when they spoke, you know, those things. He said, uh, you men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Little did he know <laughs> what he was getting himself into. Probably afterwards he would have said, man, I wish I could have gone back, you know. <laughs> It's like the first time that Charles I met Oliver Cromwell. You know, it, could there have been a time that he could have gone back and erased something in history? You know, probably when, he, when Charles, King Charles I had his head on the chopping block 
He probably thought, man, I wish I'd have never met Oliver Cromwell, you know. Same thing, this uh, rabbi, probably our leader of the synagogue, when he, he said, oh, I wish I would have never said that. Uh, but anyway, he goes there. Paul preaches in the synagogue. The Gentiles ask for the gospel presentation. There were Jews rejected. But the Gentiles are outside the synagogue listening, and they said they were gone out of the synagogue. The Gentiles besought that the words might be preached to them the next Sabbath, the next weekend when they come together. So the Bible says that almost the whole city comes to hear. Now remember, the Jews did not want anything to do with the Gentiles. They were not the chosen people. So this is a problem to the Jews. And the Bible says the next Sabbath, the next week, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Would to God we could get almost the whole city of Greer in this church? Well, we wouldn't be able to fit them in here, but if there was some way to get them all to hear the word of God, wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, but can you imagine that? I mean, I can't even imagine Almost the whole city coming together to hear something. I mean, I, I, I just can't imagine that, um, what it must have been like. Now, they must have been in one of those amphitheater things, you know, like, they, like I showed you in that other picture. But they come together to hear the word of God. Then the Jews reject them because of that, and Paul and Barnabas turn to the Gentiles says in Acts 13, 45 and 47, but when the Jews saw the multitude, here's that jealousy coming out, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first come to be spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, and thou shalt shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. This is an Old Testament prophecy in the book of Micah that says, I've sent you to the Gentiles. From this point on, now, Paul does try to go to the Jews again, but this is a pivotal point in church history to understand that from this point on, Acts chapter 13, the end of Acts chapter 13, is the story that gets us into this church in Greer, South Carolina. Because had it not been for this point right here, we would have never heard the gospel. The Gentiles would have never heard it. He would have stayed going with the Jews. But the Jews contradicted now, can you imagine? Now, who do you think sent that? Not God. Satan. Eh, remember what I told you? We saw that from the first time there in Cyprus. Every time the gospel is presented, Satan's going to try to destroy it. He's going to try to throw his counterfeit up. And that's exactly what happens. And they go to the point to where they actually blaspheme. Isn't that a strong statement? And so later on, Paul will try to go to Asia and in chapter 16, it, the Bible says that he is forbidden by the Holy Ghost to go to Asia. And he tries again and he says the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost said, do not go. And he goes to Macedonia. And again, that's the reason why he goes to Europe. Uh, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke go to Europe for the first time to carry the gospel. Uh, because of the Roman Empire. So anyway, so these are very integral parts of the story of church history. Uh, these cities are very, very important and integral. And what took place in those cities is very important as to why we're sitting in this church in Greer, South Carolina. As you go through church history and you understand how things go. But he said, and this is key, he says, we turn to the Gentiles. So here is the point to where they start to reach the Gentiles. So, an exciting thing. I love this. I love the story of the book of Acts. And this is an exciting point right here uh, that we have. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. 
Although it is a sad thing that these Jews did blaspheme and they did not believe, I am so glad that Paul and Barnabas turned to go to the Gentiles and eventually would go to Europe and our ancestors and uh, those that came and founded the United States. And I pray, God, that you would help us to always remember that, help us to have an attitude of thankfulness as we read through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.